Oh yeah. Hi, welcome back to the channel. My name is Lace and this is a Tower of Fantasy video. Today I want to be talking about Saki Fuwa, A0, A1, A3, talking about her matrices, talking about her in particular, the mechanics, because the mechanics, there are a lot of different things that you really do need to know about, such as when her surges proc, exactly what those like sword flying things are, as well as different team comps, such as oh, your Tsubasa versus your Frig over here versus uh, should you put in the Meryl, etc, etc, the trade-offs. But with that being said, let's start off with the first segment which is the mechanics. I really want to focus on this because there are a lot of really interesting things that you do need to know because whilst there are currently a lot of fantastic like DPS simulations and theoretical simulations of team rotations, most of the time it is exactly that. It's going to be theoretical, it's going to be simulations and if you're not using like the assumptions that were incorporated in those simulations such as this, watch this. That double damage right there. If you're not doing that, then you're not going to be hitting those simulation numbers. And so welcome to Saki's mechanics. But let's start off with the skill itself. And I think this is probably the one that everyone needs to know, which is that if you are a certain distance away from the target, you'll be able to do two times the damage. Uh, so if I go up real close and I use the E skill, you can see one, two, three, and then I hit him once more at the end, four. The last one is like the blades flying out, five, but really it's four hits. However, what you want to do is you want to actually be some distance away Away from the target so you can do eight hits one two three one two three and then one one so you want to be about a dodge and a jump away so if you look at this dodge jump and then it's cast then so i will show you guys it right here boom boom uh that uh one more time right here just like that and then you can see there are six hits and then another two at the very end so it is about a dodge as well as a half like about here where you would want to position to be able to hit the e like that as you can see big, big damage. On top of this double dipping, you also need to keep in mind that the range of that skill is actually extremely wide. So I can see that there is this cactus over here. However, there is a pretty good chance that if there was a monster that is like over here, I would be able to hit it. And if there was a monster like over here approximately, I would be able to hit it as well. But essentially there is quite a wide range for the attack. So if you guys have been using your frig very much, so like using the dash attack, you'll realize that you can see that range is actually really massive, right? It's actually similar to that. The E skill for the psychic weapon. The next mechanic that I want to talk about is her discharge as well as her skill and it's that they both have iframes. If you guys don't know what iframes are, they're invincibility frames. So and what I am saying here is that when I press 2 to trigger my discharge for Saki, whilst I am in all of this, I am actually completely invincible and cannot be in interrupted. And the same thing goes for the E skill. So if I cast the E skill like this one over here, throughout that entire animation, I could not be hit and I can't be CC'd either. And the same thing can be said if you guys didn't know for Frigg's E. So what that means is that this one over here, take no damage and CC as well. And why it's useful is generally more for like the defensive capabilities right you want to dodge damage boss is about to do a big hit you don't have a dodge left then you just use your discharge or your e the third thing i want to talk about is the Yu-Gi-Oh level text in uh, saki's e skill so if i come over here i come into the skill and you can see there are some uh, really long tool tips over here right so i want to really break this down because there are a lot of different sources of damage or damage mitigation depending on how you use her so the first thing is this sword thingy uh this kind of aura and this thing is called shadow sword my bad i actually got it the wrong way around it's actually called sword shadow so the sword shadow is in both the offensive and defensive form however when you are in sword shadow what you get access to is this thing called surge so um, this one over here release surge whenever you use a branch skill or a discharge skill now let me show you exactly what that looks like so i'm going to go back into saki's weapon i'm going to use a branch skill and what you're going to look out for is a big shining like arc light so Boom, did you see that one right there? It's a massive, like, massive slash. And so what that means is that every 10 seconds, you get access to that slash again. You either trigger it by using N1C, so normal attack, normal attack one time, and then hold down to charge attack. And as you can see, the swipe was there again. Or what you can do is you can actually go into discharge into Saki's weapon. So let me just charge up a little bit. So hopefully enough time has elapsed. I'm going to use the Saki one, and then you're going to see the surge straight up. Boom, that one right there. That first big bright slash is actually Surge. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna actually charge up, use the Surge, and then I'm going to go into Discharge and show you that it doesn't pop up because of the internal cooldown. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do Surge now. So you can see I triggered Surge. I'm gonna switch into Frig, and then I'm going to use the Discharge. So you're not gonna see, you're not gonna see that bright light. See, there's no bright light because the Surge is on cooldown. So 
That is search, just in case you don't believe me. So search is one of the assumptions that are placed into the simulations. It's assuming that you will actually be casting search as frequently as possible. If it has an ICD of 10 seconds, that means you're either going to be switching into Saki every 10 seconds, or you're going to be like, oh, surge is probably up. Let me go use it. And so it's for this reason that I would say that the impact of surge is that every time you have or you're in frig weapon and you have the uh, discharge up, I would recommend going into Saki so that you can trigger the surge without doing the branch attack. So what that also means is that instead of like going into Saki and then like keep auto attacking, switch out, switch out and like use Zubasa, do something else, but don't stay in Saki after you trigger surge from the discharge. And so it might be worth mentioning that there are a lot of skills such as surge, which don't trigger unless you do have the sword shadow up. So if I do the branch attack, so N1C, as you can see, there is no big bright light slash. However, after I trigger the sword shadow, I'm gonna do the N1C. And as you can see, boom, that big bright light, it's gonna be about like 20K damage. That is only going to show up then. All right, so the next thing I wanna talk about is flow. Flow is those blades that are flying out when you're in offensive form. So if I attack once, you can see that blade came out and hit it for 10K crit. And so hopefully it'll be a bit easier to see if I use my ranged weapon. As you can see, I've got like swords flying out left and right. So that's on an ICD of 0.8 seconds. Um, if I like spam attack, you can see it's coming out every 0.8 seconds, which is actually really freaking good considering it's just free damage as well as free heals. Now. This one is also really important to note because it's flow and it's directly referenced in the A stars, the ascensions. And so the tanking counterpart to flow is known as counter attack. So if I came over here, skill, I'm going to come down to the bottom and you can see I get some blocks after surge and then I get, I'm pretty sure I get three of them. Yeah, three blocks after surge. So what that means is that I'm going to go into the sword shadow mode. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to surge and then you're going to see I have three blocks. Boom, you see that one right there. And then you can see that there is a shield around me now. That's gonna grant me three blocks. And each time I get hit by something, it's going to actually counter attack. Now, counter attack is also referenced in one of the ascensions, which is why it's important to bring it up. However, whether you're in defensive or offensive form, the surge is gonna look the same. So I'm gonna do the branch attack and you're gonna see the big blue arc right there. All right, so I'm just gonna switch back to the offensive form and the attack form. And what I wanna talk about is, well, if you have to spend your time in Saki, which moves do you use? And the first move is the N1C, which is the branch attack. So normal attack, and then hold and you're going to see the spinning thing da, 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 da. but otherwise there is another option which is the jetpack saki as <laughs> uh, i don't know what's with the obsession with jetpacks but essentially you want to be in the air and then you want to do jetpack and then immediately do a left click so i'm going to go into jetpack and then left click, right? That's in slow-mo. So if I do it fast enough, it'll look like this. But what's actually happening when you do that is that you're skipping one of the very early animations. So if I do it without the jetpack, you see that slash right there, right? So I jump and then I hold left click, but there is a slash at the very start that you don't want, right? Because that's taking up too much time for a very little DPS gain. And then so again, for comparison, you go straight into the dive, right? There is no random slash at the very start. Saki's aerial attack chain, as well as her normal attack chain are actually quite good as well. However, as most of us King players know, it's just really freaking tough to actually pull it entirely off because more often than not, you're gonna get CC'd or bumped out of it. And so what I'm gonna say is that no, Saki is not really a character that you want to be spending the majority of your time in. Yes, you want to be in it to proc that surge right there, but you also want to be like casting the skill. Outside of that, you don't really want to be using Saki. And so where exactly do you want to be in then? You want to be in Frigg or you want to be in Tsubasa? However, we'll cover that in the team comps a little bit later. That is a pretty good segue into, well, what exactly is Saki's role then? So Saki changes dramatically whether you have her at A0 or A1. Anything else like A3, A5, I don't really like care about because it's not that significant of a change. However, it's really the one star that is gonna change the entire comp and the way that you play. So at A0, we don't have this reset over here. Most of you already know about the reset because it is essentially her most famous trait. And so if you have Saki at A0, the majority of the time is gonna be spent with Saki being the shield breaker. So that's very, very similar to like your traditional comps, kind of like the 1.0 comps. You've got a DPS, you've got a resonance, and then you've got a shield breaker over here. This could be Saki. This shiro right here could be Saki. However, if it's like that, it's kind of like saying, well, why should I roll for Saki if she's just going to be a shield breaker if I already have Meryl? And the answer to that is like, well, you're kind of right. Personally, I would say that Saki at A0 is not really worth trying to replace the Meryl at 
any A's. The one thing that I do want to mention about Saki over Meryl is that the playstyle is just a lot more fun and the fact that she actually has two iframes where Meryl has none. And honestly, that pretty much rounds out the A0 Saki. TLDR, she's a shield breaker. Kind of like, um, yeah, like a 1.0 style shield breaker. Now, if you're able to gain access to the A1, the one star over here, when Frost Resonance is activated, all weapon skill cooldowns are cleared every five times weapon skills are used and the damage of flow and counter attack are increased by one time for the next 25 seconds. And so what that means is that after triggering the reset, your flow and your counter attack are gonna be increased. I think it's double damage for the next 25 seconds. And so before I trigger that double damage flow, I'm gonna show you, I'm gonna hit him and you can see the flow is hitting for 7.45K. That was an 11K crit. That was an 11K crit. Um, that is a 6.3K flow, 6.5K flow. And then I'm gonna show you now the double damage flow. So I'm gonna charge up. You can see my counter is up to four. It's really, really important to monitor that. I'm gonna now use my freak skill twice. So that's one over there. And then uh, one more time over there. So now I have actually triggered that double damage. Hit, and you can see that 22K over there. So if I actually just like put that over there, I'm gonna normal attack over here. Normal attack, boom, 22K. Boom, 15K. Boom, 24K. As you can see, for the next 25 seconds, I'm gonna have this at double damage, 15K. Okay, the blades are kind of like hitting the walls and stuff, but uh, 8K, and so it has worn out. However, because flow is essentially automatic, we don't really have to think about it. It's when we get down to the A3, where it boosts surge, where we gotta start thinking about things. So what exactly happens at A3, three stars, is that our sword shadow surge increases to 350% frost attack. That is, it's actually doubled in damage. So unfortunately, I don't have it to show you guys, but this 175% goes up to 350%. On top of that, the surge actually reduces in cooldown down to five seconds. And what that means is that you probably should more frequently change into your Saki weapon so that you can use this branch attack thing, normal into that big surge over there, N1C, normal one into charge attack so that you can get that 350% damage every five seconds because you're not gonna be able to keep up with the discharges. And so what that does mean is that the uptime of your frig is actually gonna be lowered because you're gonna spend a little bit more time in your Saki pulling off those surges. The other utility of the three star surge reduce cooldown is that you're able to get counter attack more often. So if you remember after using surge, this one over here, we gain three blocks. If the cooldown has been reduced by half from 10 seconds to five seconds, it means that we're actually getting twice as many blocks in the same amount of time. And so that's the reason why people say like, oh, the three stars Saki is where you want to be if you want to be a tank player. However, if you weren't using this, if you weren't exploiting this surge thing, then that means that you weren't blocking, you weren't taking advantage of like the six blocks every 10 seconds. Then, you know, what's the point, right? <laughs> Other than that, there's not too much to talk about for five and six stars. Five gives you an extra Fantasia. However, it actually shares the cooldown of your normal dodging Fantasia and six star gives you a little bit more damage. That's kind of the TLDR. I would say that the major breakpoint is at the A1, A0 and A3. I would recommend if you are going for Saki, go for the A1. Either that or respect that at A0, she is essentially just a shield breaker. And while she is actually incredibly good at it, she is technically replaceable, especially with Meryl. All right, so I think that's enough of the gaming itself. I'm gonna go over to the spreadsheet because uh, who doesn't like a little bit of spreadsheets? And so here we are with kind of like my evaluation of each of the different characters, the Frost characters at each of their different breakpoints, A0 through to A5. I wanna talk about all of this because this is going to essentially put together the rationale as to why I think this is the best team and how exactly having different stars on different characters could actually influence your team. So for example, at your girl Tsubasa A5, she actually becomes the main DPS. I would recommend against going into Frig and doing the infinite dash attacks. However, let's not get ahead of ourselves. And so let's start off with the Tsubasa at the zero stars. At zero stars, she's not a damage support. She is potential main DPS using the aerial normal attacks. And what I mean by that is that she jumps up and she shoots down. And that's kind of it, just the normal chain, but in the air. However, in the context of Asaki A1 comp with the reset, the real value of Tsubasa is in her super low skill CD because it's on a 12 second CD. And what a really fast CD does is it actually allows you to cast that reset faster and faster. So I do have this timeline over here. We'll go through it in a short moment. However, let's move on to the one star Tsubasa over here. So at one star, she gets the extra, the arrows thing, the sharp arrows. And at this point, she is a relatively good damage support. However, it does require three dodge attacks to fully stack. And 
at three stars, she gets it like one dodge, three arrows. To be honest, it's never really worked out like that for me. Usually I have to dodge more than once. However, in the context of the Frost team, what you do need to remember is that the dodge DPS is still actually fantastic, but only if all three arrows hit. I believe it's at three stars where the Zubasa dodge attacks is as strong as the Frigg with the Huma dodge attack. However, the most drastic change is at the five stars where the aerial N1C arrow rain, it actually gets you the most DPS gain. And so for those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, N1C, is this. However, if you do it in the air, it's actually a lot faster. So I'm gonna let that one cast. I'm gonna jump into the air and I'm gonna go boom, boom. And the good thing about the C5, about the five stars when you get it on Tsubasa, is that the duration of that arrow rain actually doubles, therefore technically doubling the DPS. Now, it is a little bit hard to land all of the hits onto the mobs, but even if you land like 80% of the hits, it's still actually a substantial amount of damage where it's actually possible to not do the freak infinite dash attacks and just do this kind of thing like forever. So like boom, boom. It, it takes a little bit to get used to because it's like, uh, it's a little bit hard. But that my guys is the Tsubasa C5 Arrow Rain double duration that I don't have. I have like three stars or something. All right, so after that, we have the Frig at zero star up to five star. Now this one is pretty straightforward because we all kind of know how she works. But if you don't have the Frig, what you can do is you can use the Tsubasa, uh, the aerial attacks instead as the main DPS. Or you could actually be using your Saki with the branch attack or the dive. Okay, so at zero stars, the most likely main DPS with infinite dodge attacks. And this is not only because of the interaction with the Huma matrices, like therefore giving you like 160% attack, but it's also because the dodge attacks are incredibly safe to use. They give you repositioning like literally every 0.8 seconds and you can trigger Fantasia off of it. Now, coming over to the one star, it is actually incredibly strong at this point. So I'm talking the A1 Frig, as well as the A1 Saki. This interaction is probably the most famous, but if you're not using it, then well, here, let's start talking about it now. So what I wanna show you guys is the double pop. And so as you can see, I have four charges over here. I'm about to hit the fifth charge and my frostiness points are coming down. But when I use this first skill, as you can see, I'm gonna go into the domain. But what happens is that when I use the second skill because of the reset, you're gonna see the pop. So you're gonna see probably like 100k damage somewhere. I'm gonna try it here again. So I'm gonna go into the fifth one. That's a reset. And then I'm gonna do it again. Hopefully you can see it right there, 124K. And that is the pop of the first field. And then I'm gonna get a second pop of this field that is on the field right now. And so what that means is that I've effectively scored another one of those Frig A1s. And for those of you who don't know what the Frig A1 does, essentially at the end of the field, it does a pop. And that pop does a big amount of damage, which as you saw for me, it was 124K. And so realistically speaking, it's at A1 for Frig, which is kind of like the best breakpoint. And don't worry if you don't have the A1 Frig, it's completely okay. At the end of the day, it's just more DPS. However, the A1 Saki is not just more DPS, right? It does drastically change her gameplay and changes the whole team's gameplay. The A5 on the Tsubasa drastically changes the gameplay because of the main DPS kind of role. The A1, it could, but you could also do without it. However, moving on, as for Frigg's 3-star and 5-star, there's just a little bit more damage. It's like bigger pops, but aside from that, not too much to write home about. And then let's quickly talk about Saki, although we've already talked about her. At A0, she is mainly just a really good shield breaker. A1, she has the incredible reset that I just showed you, and we're going to take advantage really, really soon in the timeline over here. At A3, as you saw, the extra damage and the extra blocks because of the reduced cooldown on the Surge. And then at 5-stars, she gets a forced Fantasia where she can just dodge into a Frost Fantasia. However, again, it does share the same CD as the normal one. So it's kind of like, it's good. It's not the greatest, but it's still really good. Now, the last character that I wanted to talk about was actually the Meryl herself. So at zero stars, she is a very, very strong sub DPS using endurance because her spin to win, the ratios are actually like through the roof, right? And so that makes her both a really good DPS, a sub DPS, because you have to wait for the endurance to recharge, but also a very, very strong shatterer. Now at one star, she is an even better shatterer, but now of healing. And so as you can see, like even at A0 or at A1, she is essentially the same as Asaki. So at this point, they are still interchangeable. And the only thing that Meryl gets better at as she gets more stars 
is essentially more and more damage, especially at five stars where she gets a plus 50% damage and plus 50% shatter boost on her shield up. And so she, I'm pretty sure like that is the highest endurance ratios when she has her shield and has this buff up out of all of the characters. However, I would say that the break point for Meryl, like kind of the most value point is at the A1 where she actually gets healing. And this healing has saved my ass more times than once. Outside of that though, it's kind of whatever. And the last thing I do want to mention about Meryl is that her cooldown is at 45 seconds. And so what that means is that it's going to drastically change the timeline and change your rotations if you include her instead of your Zubasa or instead of your Sa- actually it doesn't really affect your Saki because we need the Saki A1 for the reset. All right, so before we get into the timeline, let me quickly talk about the matrices. I think I do have some over here. And so main DPS, I say main DPS over here, but what I really mean is who are you going to spend your most time in, like which character? And the one that's going to change is the A5 Zubasa. So if you spend the majority of your time in the A5 Zubasa, then she is going to use the main DPS matrices, which are these ones over here. However, she has a special matrix set, which is Claudia. And this Claudia two-piece set allows her to essentially stay in the air forever and really make that A5 or the N1C spam, like the arrow rain spam, really, really easy. Outside of the Claudia two-piece, I personally wouldn't do it because I suck at it. But just remember that it is a choice. After the main DPS set, like so whether it goes onto your A5 Tsubasa, onto your A1 Frig, or like your something Saki, you're going to be thinking about the other ones, which are your essentially damage support. The first damage support set would be the Frig set. So I think I've got it over here. This one right here where we've trapped Frig's face into a Yu-Gi-Oh card. This one, essentially, you have to equip it onto Frig if you use the four-piece set, but it's, in essence, more frost damage. And the same kind of can be said for the Saki 4 one. I know it's a little bit scuffed over here, but the TLDR of this set is that if you equip it on anybody else aside from your main DPS, you're going to get more frost damage and uh, you're going to apply some frost damage uh, amplification on the target enemy. However, if you are a low spender or a masochist like me who doesn't roll for these because um, it actually there's a lot of RNG involved, you could opt instead to use some of the DPS ones over here. So if it were me, I would either use like the Shiro and the King for your shield breaker or I would quite literally just run some of your like main DPS ones onto your other two weapons. I also actually really, really like the Pepper matrices. However, especially as our level cap is going higher and higher, these ones are going to get outscaled. All right, so with all of that being said, let's start talking about the timeline over here. Essentially, the one up here is the time scale. So this is in seconds up to 75 seconds. And essentially, I've just said, oh, one action will take about one second to cast. So what I've done here is one type of timeline where we can start off by buffing with Zubasa dash attack, going into Frig skill one, and then that's the whole cooldown, and then switching to Saki using her skill, which is the second skill. So the one, two, three, four, five is just counting the amount of skills we've used so that we can actually keep track of the resets. So what you're going to see is I'm going to use Frig and then Saki. I'm going to surge in Saki by using the N1C and then go over to Zubasa, use her skill. And then I'm going to go back to Frig dash attack all the way up until it's about 18 seconds and then go back to Tsubasa dash attack and then skill this dash attack is going to hopefully get us the three times buff again or the one times buff maybe you go to dash attack three times and then after using her dash attack over here I'm going to use her skill because it's on a 12 second cooldown so it's actually up before the other two and then here is where it gets a bit interesting you could either go into Saki to surge using the N1C, or if you have discharge, you don't need to go into the Saki to trigger the surge because the discharge will do it for you, right? And so what that means is that if you have discharge, use it into Saki and then trigger the surge. But if you haven't triggered the surge yet, then you need to go into Saki to use the N1C. After that, what you can do is switch back to Frig, DA, 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 dash attack, dash attack, dash attack until the end of time. And then what you're going to realize is that we're going to hit the end over here. We're at skill four, four casts, and then there is a fifth one over here. Before doing the fifth skill cast, we want to go back into Tsubasa to do the DA times three to do like the skill damage buff or like the uh, frost attack buff. And then we're going to use the skill of Frig once, and then we're going to use it again because of the reset. And what that's going to do is it's going to actually do the bubble pop between five and six. And so six, we have the domain up again. And what you're gonna realize is that this from here on is actually the same 
as from here. Now, the thing about this timeline is that it actually assumes Frig main DPS. The other alternatives is that if you're using Tsubasa DPS, then these DAs would instead be Tsubasa in the air doing the arrow rain, the N1C. On the other hand, if you have the Saki A3, you can trigger the surge every five seconds. And so each of these are actually gonna be halved. And then you're gonna have to go into Saki more often to be able to use the N1C to trigger the surge. And so it's for this reason why I would say that this timeline is not important. And everything that I said at the start of the video is way more important because you understand the mechanics. You are thinking as you're going, you're making the decisions as you're going, you're like, okay, well, I'm playing through, playing through bygone and then you're like oh it's time to use surge it's surge in time and so yeah i just wanted to run through this example timeline because i wanted to show what exactly it could look like there's another reason for like why it's sequenced like this and it's because you need to take into account the weapon switching cooldown and so that's why it's going from tsubasa into frig then saki and then back into Tsubasa. Because what ideally could happen if there was no weapon switching cooldown, it would be actually Tsubasa into Frig into Tsubasa again. That's how I would do it because I want the Tsubasa to be up as soon as possible so I can keep spamming it. But with that, my guys, that is going to bring us to the conclusion. And so what I wanna know is, did you guys roll for Saki? And are you guys enjoying playing with her? Personally, I feel like she is very, very strong. However, I'm still personally trying to get my head around the rotations because there is like a lot of calculated and methodology to it but I think that when I finally nail all of these like cooldowns all of these concepts and kind of like come up with my own flow and timeline it's going to be really really freaking good however my guys it's about you not about me so I'm going to shut up and you guys tell me did you guys roll for the Saki and how are you guys finding her and if you guys do end up leaving a comment then thank you guys so much if you did enjoy this video or found it kind of helpful please consider leaving a like subscribing to the channel or turning on that notification bell however as your girl Saki once said all good things must come to an end. So thank you guys so much for watching. I'll catch you guys in the next video. Bye-bye.